On the eve of the Copenhagen summit on greenhouse gases, I'm talking to Lord Christopher Monckton, a renowned climate change sceptic. He's attending Copenhagen to persuade delegates that the science is faulty. Lord Monckton, thanks very much for talking to RT today. First of all, could you just explain your general stance on climate change? The climate has always changed, the climate is changing, the climate will continue to change. Humankind does not have the power to do very much about it, and we would be arrogant to assume that we can. What evidence do you have that climate change isn't man-made? The scientific question amounts to this. Are the greenhouse gases that we add to the atmosphere sufficient in quantity and in global warming potential to stop outgoing heat energy bouncing in from the sun, uh, hitting the earth and then going back out into space again. Are they strong enough to stop it going out into space so that it stays down here and causes a little bit of warming? Well, we know that they cause a little bit of warming because the entire atmosphere keeps the planet around 18 or 20 Celsius warmer than it would be if we didn't have an atmosphere. So the greenhouse effect of all the greenhouse gases now existing in the atmosphere is only 18 or 20 Celsius. It's tiny. So the idea that changing one two thousandth of the composition of the atmosphere from oxygen to carbon dioxide as we may do this century if we go on burning fossil fuels as much as we like will somehow cause a warming of anything up to six celsius degrees or something like a third of the effect of the entire existing atmosphere is plainly nonsense do you think that climate change as it stands at the moment is a political fad of course it is. These scares come and go. You may remember the millennium bug. You may remember swine flu, which is another scare that's running at the moment. Virologists making a fortune out of saying it's all very terrible. In fact, the number of people killed by swine flu is smaller than the number of people killed by ordinary flu. That's now blindingly obvious. It always was blindingly obvious. But the bi virologist got in there, whipped up the scare, made lots of money, just as the climatologists have been very successfully doing for 20 years. This is the biggest scientific scare that's ever got off the ground but now it has come to an end and it's come to a complete end because recently after 20 years of careful measurement using the earth radiation budget experiment satellite we have been able to determine that the amount of outgoing radiation escaping into space is almost as great as it always was. The extra greenhouse gases we're adding are making some difference, but very, very small. So we might be looking over the whole of the next century at a global warming of at most one, perhaps one and a half Celsius degrees, more likely just half a Celsius degree, something which is negligible and generally beneficial, certainly nothing that requires any policy action whatsoever except to have the courage to do nothing. And if what you say is true, why would uh, the climate change lobby and governments either exaggerate or totally invent the threat of global warming? Well, we know that the class politique and the class scientifique, the, the great and the good, are conspiring together to make up the evidence because just uh, weeks ago uh, it was revealed that at the Climate Research Centre at the University of East Anglia and among scientists in league with that centre right across the world, data had been blatantly fabricated to produce the desired result of pretending there was a problem when there isn't one. And so this news that data have been fabricated, computer models have been tinkered with, computer code has been tampered with, um, things have simply been made up, temperature records have been simply created out of nothing. All of this news doesn't come as a surprise to me because the people who were named in those emails are people on whom I've had my eye for some time. Um, others I'm in contact with have been noting the political and financial connections between these scientists and politicians. And so it's very clear that what has happened is yet another attempt by the governing class of the world, if you like, to take advantage of the little guy, to conspire against the governed, to have another excuse for 
exaggerated levels of taxation and of regulation and of interference. Isn't it a fact that the polar ice cap is melting? A hundred years ago people used to skate on the Thames River. Just in the last few weeks we've had enormous floods in Cumbria. Aren't these all evidence that climate change is in fact happening? You notice climate phenomena happening. You say, oh well, we don't know why these climate phenomena are happening. We don't even check whether they've happened before. So we'll just say, we'll invent uh, a scare and we'll say that it's humankind that is causing these changes to happen. And it's, uh, if I explain it that way, you can see how absurd that entire line of argument is. Yes, the North Polar ice cap lost 27%. And that is exactly, we're going to back that up and come back, because they can say, oh, look, it got 27% smaller in the summer, but it came back the next winter. But see, they play little statistical games. And when you read the Club of Rome and UN documents from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, they talk about inventing. They think you're so stupid, they have public reports talking about how they just invented it to make you the enemy so they can cut your resources off and not let you have children. They know it's a fraud. Do you understand that? They know it's a fraud. And the emails just prove that that much more. Okay, let's go back to Lord Moncton. The argument is, yes, the North Polar ice cap lost 27% of the ice that is normally there at the summer minimum in 2007 compared with that which we had known was normal from 30 years of satellite observations. But it's grown back by 24 percent in the last two years. So that shows the enormous volatility of the Arctic climate. It's famous for it. And the floods in Cumbria, a thousand year event. But you see, if you take a hundred different microclimates which exist in Britain, and there are ten different climatic extreme events that could happen in each one, you're going to get a thousand year event once a year. These extreme weather events come around just as they always have in any chaotic object, mathematically speaking, you would expect this to happen. It tells us nothing about whether the world is steadily warming. Yes, it has been warming for 300 years, during 280 of which we couldn't have had anything to do with it. And the Antarctic ice cap is expanding. The sea ice in the Antarctic reached a record extent in 2007, three weeks after the record minimum in the Arctic. There was a record maximum in the Antarctic. The IPCC has a huge body of seemingly solid scientific evidence behind it, and they say that it's 90% likely that climate change is man-made. How do you refute that? There is no scientific basis whatsoever for saying there is a 90% probability that most of the warming of the last 50 years was caused by humankind. None whatsoever. You could go, for instance, to a paper by Scafetta and West just last year, saying that 69% of all the warming of the last 50 years was caused by the sun. I'm not entirely convinced by that argument either. The fact is we have no means of knowing what are the influences that cause the climate to fluctuate in the short term, upwards or downwards? This is simply beyond our capacity to measure or analyse. What we do know, and this we can do by laboratory experiment and by a little bit of elementary mathematics, is what the maximum possible effect of adding CO2 to the atmosphere can be. And the answer is, it's very, very, very small. Even if climate change theory hasn't been entirely put to the test, isn't it better to do something now rather than wait for flooding, drought and temperature rises? The precautions themselves, let us say, in the shape of replacing one third of the world's agricultural land, which grew food, with growing biofuels instead. So we were once growing food for people that needed it. Now we grow biofuels for clunkers that don't. Result? a doubling of world food prices in just over a year. Three quarters of which was attributed by the World Bank to this biofuel scam which comes out of the global warming scare. Result, if we have to pay twice as much for our food, it's inconvenient. If you're in a poor country, that difference of 100% in the price of your food is the difference between life and death. There have been major food riots in a dozen regions of the world hardly reported at all in the West, because they're so busy reporting on every little icicle putatively dribbling in Greenland. And those food riots are happening because people are dying by the million 
of starvation who would not have died at all had this climate scare not engendered this dash for biofuels. What do you think will happen to the climate in, say, the next hundred years? I asked the world's greatest expert on climate that, and that is Professor Richard Lindzen of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, generally recognized to be the man who knows more than anyone else in the world about how the atmosphere will behave. And I said to him, Dick, I said, I've been asked to make a bet on whether it's going to be warmer or cooler in the next 50 years. Can you tell me? He said, yes, I can. It will be either warmer 